So if you have tried to use vector search, um, you will see great potential, but also flaws, obvious flaws uh, that it fails in quite some scenarios. And today we want to share our experiences and approaches some, uh, to improve the, um, to remove these flaws and improve the experience of vector search. Welcome to Model Fine Tuning for Search. From algorithm to free infer, this is Bo, and I'm Max. And so what we will roughly do, initially I will motivate a little bit why we do what we do. Then Bo will talk a lot about the embedding model, how to use losses to uh, optimize in different situations, and how to scale up our whole approach of fine-tuning to do a lot of fine-tuning runs in parallel and to um, yeah, do a lot of experimentation to do the right things afterwards. Uh, I will then talk a little bit about uh, how we do dataset preparations and synthesis, and then we will come to a conclusion. Or to make it more graphical, um, if you try to fine-tune, uh, model, usually what you have, you have some articles, documents, whatever, and some historical uh, queries of users, or you don't have them, depends. And then you somehow need to prepare training data. This is the second part of the talk. And after you have the training data, you will fine tune. This is the first part of the talk. And at the end, you get a fine tuned model, which you can use in production. So, why do we want to do this? Uh, you saw in the morning, if who, anybody who was in the talk of Atita, uh, she showed this problem, uh, or how we, the, we did some fine-tuning with them together. This is the chorus um, front-end. Um, and one thing that we see, there are different needs in, of users that needs to be infused into the models, which are not in pre-trained models. So one thing that she showed there was themes. So uh, office organization, you see, okay, this doesn't really work with pre-trained models, and note taking on the right-hand side, this also doesn't really work with pre-trained models. So this is something that you want to solve, and you want to somehow uh, infuse this skill into a model. This is one part why you want, we want to do fine-tuning, and the second part is that we have the wrong feature. So here, a model performs really well in face recognition, but when you do fashion search, we don't care about the faces, we care about the fashion articles, and so you, and when you see in the middle, there is this somewhat center image, and around are the most closest images. And the model will always uh, give you similar faces, but in fashion search, you don't want this, so you somehow want to unlearn this feature. This is the second part why we do fine-tuning, to somehow get rid of certain features in pre-trained models. So much for the motivation, and now I hand over to Bo. We'll talk about the uh, Thanks, Max, for the introduction. Uh, let me go continue with our talk. So first of all, I will talk about the embedding models. So what is the embedding model? The embedding model is basically a deep learning model which produces the vector embeddings. So it, you take an information you want to encode, you use feed this information into your embedding model, and this embedding model outputs an n-dimensional vector space, which you can utilize for, I don't know, search, uh, clustering, anomaly detection, different kind of purposes. So let me first give a short introduction. How can you get an embedding model? Starting from the simple case, for the vision case, if you want to build a, like a vision similarity, similarity search, so this is relatively simple. So most of the computer vision models are trained, uh, such as the convolution neural nets, are trained for classification or recognition tasks. If you can see from the input here in the left, uh, we have uh, basically a cat-dog classifier, which outputs a probability of this image being a cat or a dog. But how can you embed it, uh, convert this model, this model into an embedding model? You just remove the last, uh, what we call, fully connected layer. Then you get basically an embedding model. Apparently, you can also remove the pooling layer and replace the pooling layer with what you want as a pooling layer. So. The ver the, in the, for the vision case, it is, rel uh, it is relatively simple. But for the test text case, it's a little bit tricky. So here I'm demonstrating the sentence embeddings. So here you, you see two tables. The upper table shows a batch of like, sentences uh, with, different, with different lengths. So first of all, we try to pad these sentences into the same lens. So you'll see there are a lot of like pad tokens after some words, but the third, the third, the, but the third sentence have the maximum length, which is 12. This padding operation allows us to perform the matrix modification. So another thing you need to notice is the table below, which is basically a set of one or zero. So the one means the token is present in the sentence. Zero means the token does not present in the sentence, which basically a pad token. So after we obtain this kind of two uh, undi uh, arrays or something like that, we can basically do a modification between these two undi arrays. So this will result in a shape. Uh, 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 it's not a three-dimensional matrix with 
batch size sequence length with DIMM, which dimension, uh, in our case is like 4, 12, 768. 768 is basically what bird based and cased give you, the dimensionality of the bird. So you will see that this is a step, two, a step one. In the step two, we basically aggregate all the tokens. We're basically summing up all the token embeddings on the x-axis, so on the sentence level. So this results in a, 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 a new shape. Basically, we trimmed the second dimensionality of the vector space into 4 by 768, 4, which is the batch size 76. The 768 is basically the dimensionality which BERT gives you. But you might see that we basically sum up all the token embeddings along this x-axis. Then we need to normalize it. Why? Because some of the tokens are does not present in the token because they are being padded. For example, this first sentence got, a seven, to uh, got seven tokens, second got 10. So we basically do the normalization, which all or we call it produce the mean values by dividing the 7, dividing the 10, dividing 12, dividing 4. So this operation, uh, one, two, three step appro uh, approach, gives, uh, gives us a meaningful representation for the sentences. This is basically how uh, we implement the insight. Uh, we have at Gina AI, we have a tool called Fantiner and we implement a component called Taylor. So Taylor basically allows us to take arbitrary deep learning models, which is uh, in PyTorch. So it can basically interpret the model architecture and the layers, which layer can be removed, which layer can be inserted into. So it's quite flexible. Then if this is a computer vision model, we basically cut the classification layer, which is basically the cat dog layer. But for the text models, this does not uh, does not uh, need it. Then the, in the third approach, we basically attach a pooling layer on, at the end of the model. For example, you can choose from the mean pooling, weighted mean pooling in some cases works best, max pooling, mean pooling, or gene pooling. Gene pooling works nice for the image classification tasks. Now, we have the embedding model, but this doesn't really work out of the box. Now, what you need to do is you need to bring these similar items together following a loss function. And we will basically categorize your search cases, potentially, based on the training data format you have. So for different kind of training data, you might end up with different loss functions. For example, if I have training data with labels, if I have categorical labels, you might go to the first case. If I have a numerical labels, which query document pair then follows a, a value, indicates how similar these two items are. And if you don't have query data, but you have this kind of pairwise data, which indicates these two items are a true positive pair, which means they are two related to each other or if you don't have any data. In the fourth case, Max will introduce, if I don't have any data, how can we, how can we find it? But I will firstly cover these first three like, categories. Now let's move to the categorical data. So this is actually what we do. If you look at the first row of this, uh, this diagram, it's basically a list of products or items you want to encode. The numbers in this small like blocks are basically class labels because in this case you have categorical labels. It could be, it could be a T-shirt, sneaker, or whatever. You think they should be clustered together. So to simplify this case, we only created four classes: one, two, three, four. And to the first thing we do is we create a batch sampler, which basically sample a batch of training data into our uh, pipeline. For example, in this batch sampler, we've sampled a batch of 16 items from the training data. Then, but this sampler doesn't really mean we just random sample. Basically, what we do is an evenly sampling from our training data. We in, in the end, we end up with the number of 16 items evenly sampled from four classes, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 4, 4, 4, 4. Then what we do is this kind of triplet and tuple construction. So if you look at the triplets below, we have uh, three triplets examples. 1, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4. The 1, 0 is basically a, a what we call the anchor. The 1, 1 is the positive, which the underscore 1 or under, underscore 1 is the, basically the position of this item in the, in, the, in the batch. 
So we end up with a lot of triplets where 2, 4, which is basically class label 4 at position 4. And in, after this triplet construction, we will end up a lot of triplets for as our training data. Then we feed these triplets into our deep learning model. Our objective is actually quite simple. If you look at the first case and the anchor, which is one zero, one underscore zero, it has a positive, which is one one, but they are quite far from, far from each other in the vector space. So what we want to do is we want to prove these items closely enough. And if you look at one zero and the negative two four, we want to push them apart away from each other. So that is basically the objective we try to optimize in case you have categorical labels. But if you think about a problem, there is a problem here. So what if this model, origin, uh, pre-trained model, origin, uh, already pro, uh, provide good embeddings, which the 1-1, one, 1-0 one, one, is already close enough, and this one 0 and 2, 4, it's already far away from each other. In this case, we call it a easy negative. If we look at the he, uh, 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 feature space here, so still we have this 1, 0, which is the anchor, 1, 1 is positive, 2, 4 is negative. If the distance between the 2, 4 is smaller than the distance between the uh, if the distance between 2, 4 and 1, 0 is smaller than the distance between the uh, 1, 0 and 1, 1, which is basically the anchor and positive, then we call it a hard negative. This kind of hard negative gives us the best training data. If you look at uh, in the second circle, there is the 2, 4, which is S, which we call semi-hard negative. So basically this means that this negative is a little bit far away from the positive, but still it's within a a, a margin uh, within of, in, of this circle. So we call it semi-hard semi negative. In, the, in some cases, semi-hard negatives can help us learning some uh, useful features. But either negatives, which means the model originally performed good on these uh, triplets, we can basically filter them out because they are just don't contribute to the training. So in the end, we get a list of triplets, but only the first one is the hard negative, the rest ones are either or semi-hard negatives, we just remove them, then only utilize the hard negatives for the training. This is the case for the categorical labels. Let's go to the second case. What if you have the numer numerical labels? So query document and, the sim and a similarity label. So in this, oh, sorry. In this case, it's much more easy, actually. Uh, what you need to optimize is just a mar uh, uh, mar uh, what? Margin <laughs> MSE loss, which basically means you have query document pairs and you have ground truth labels. And you encode your uh, query and document, get two embeddings, measure the cosine of similarity or whatever similarity between each other. Then you can get predict values. What you need to do is just minimize this MSE loss, which is basically using the YI, which is the ground truth. Uh, 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 minus the y hat, which is basically the predict value, then you square them, summing them up, and divide it by the number of items in the training data. So this is basically uh, the machine learning one, 101 course, which teaches you how to predict house price, all these kind of things. In this case, it's relatively easy. However, to gain this kind of uh, similarity values between items is quite hard. So now let's move to the third case. What if you don't have any indications how similar these two items are? So you only have like pairwise data, which means the query one and document one are true positives, or query two and document four are true positives. This kind of information is much easier to get. For example, you, if, if you have a user query and user clicked something, then you have kind of signal this user query is related to this product. So we call it a true positive. So in case you have this kind of data, what you can do is basically like this. You can have a text encoder, which is basically a text embedding model. You encode all your queries from Q1 to Qn. You encode all your documents, which is D1 to Dn. What you will get, you will get a, like a similarity matrix between each other, which looks like this. So you know the diagonal of this matrix means these are the true positives. What you want to minimize 
is what you are trying to try to optimize can be converted into a classification loss function. So, for example, given the query one, which document is likely to be the real or the true positive of document one, or given given the query two, which document is likely to be the true positive of the or true positive of the matched item of query two. So this is basically can be converted into a cat dog classification problem using the cross entropy loss. And it is also quite easy for you to integrate the hard negative mining into this strategy. If you look at the query three and document three, the golden label, which Q3 and D3 should be form a pair. This should be, the label should be one, but the current score is 0.4. So in this case, the query three and document one, which is the, has the higher similarity score, which is 0.5, or query three with document N, which is, has the, have an even higher score of 0.6, this can be considered as hard negatives. And the rest, such as Q3, D2, can be filtered out from the training data. If you happen to know the OpenAI Clip model, basically they are doing the same thing. However, they, they are a, li a little bit different. So in this case, they have pre-trained two models instead of one model. You have an image encoder and a text encoder. So image encoder, let's use the text. Let's suppose user want to query text to images, search images using the text. So the query has been embedded using the text encoder, then the images is embedded in using the image encoder, and we get something like this, uh, something like a, sim a similarity matrix as well. What the clip help us is doing is it's still the classification loss, but it's classified into two dimensions. For example, the Q1, which is the text. Given this text, which image is the, is, the, is the right match for this text. If you look at the uh, column level, giving each image which text mostly match this document. In the end, you are basically optimizing two cross entropy losses or two classification losses. Then you're averaging them, these two losses. This is basically op your objective to bring text and image together. It's, it is worth note, to note that the, the, the image, uh, the clip, the clip text embedder and the clip image encoder can be used to search across modalities, which means you can basically, if you have a product search system, now you can embed your images using the image encoder together with the text encoder and build a real multimodal hybrid search. This gives you this, person, uh, this chance to do such things. So in order to achieve this within, within the fine tuner, we basically implemented uh, another module, which is called Tuner. The Tuner takes care of the training loop, such as the dataset preparation, PyTorch, basically PyTorch datasets, data loaders, and the training loop, which is basically for giving the batch, uh, how you can uh, do the op uh, optimize dot step, uh, this kind of thing. Then the hard negative mining, monitoring, distributed training, sometimes your model cannot fit into the one GPU, and the automatic mixed precision training. So uh, using like flow point 16 for, for training, and the list of callbacks, such as evaluation callback, because it has been very popular, and weights and bias callback to monitor your mach machine learning trains, and the checkpointing and the tuner states. You can see we did some experiments. This is uh, the model we get uh, from the ResNet model. We basically cut the classification layer, trained, fine tuned the model using a relatively small model, ResNet 52. And uh, on a vision dataset, which basically have 10 classes, each color represents for a class. The before tuning, what the model gives you is something really messed. But after, you, after like five epochs, like 15 minutes tuning, what you get is the clearly separated different classes, which helps you to get better embeddings and potentially help you improve your search. And now we have talked about the embedding model, the loss functions. Now we move to how did we scale up within Gina AI to train on the cloud. So the user story looks like this. We have a, a, another uh, team which helps us build the authentication layer and the storage of the data set and the models. So if you look at the 
a rectangle below. This is actually the fine tuner part. What we do is we conceptualize the uh, concepts with into two things. One thing is called experiment, another thing is called run. So basically, each run is an instance of an, uh, of an experiment. So you can change some parameter from the experiment and make a new run. And each experiment consists of multiple runs. So after the user set up a fine run, we basically help user create, it, uh, create a cloud like computational, uh, uh, like isolated. Uh, resources, including some memory, GPU, CPU, and uh, this uh, hard disk. Then inside this uh, small machine, we basically download the training data from the cloud, which user has already pushed to the cloud. Then what we do is run the tailor part to convert the model into an embedding model, then run the tuner part, which runs the loss functions, data, and gets a fine-tuned model. Then we push this fine-tuned model back to the cloud. So you, we offer users some monitoring solutions, such as Wit and Bias or MFLow, to monitor the training loop, everything. And if user thinks the model is ready, then he will come back. To, uh, he will finish the training. Otherwise, he go back to the uh, create a new run. So this is uh, basically the user journey. And underneath is basically a. Uh, Three components, we call it three components plus two uh, clusters. Three components, which, which is the Fontainer client, Fontainer API, and Fontainer core. Core is the algorithm part, API is basically a fast API instance, and Fontainer client is basically a Python client which sends HTTP requests. And there's uh, two uh, clusters, which is the compute cluster, API cluster, and compute cluster. We basically split the Fontainer job using a Kubernetes workflow engine called Argo workflow. So if you look at the workflow engine uh, in the below, so when we receive a fine run, so basically it cut this entire fine tuning job into several phases. First, it do the validation of the user input, which is basically a Kubernetes pod. Then it runs the pool of training data from the cloud. Then it started to uh, process the data set and collate the data set. After this happens, a user can basically start a fine tuning job. So this fine tuning job is the point where the user journey could split because sometimes people require CPU for fine tuning, sometimes GPU is utilized. And this part we can optimize cost a little bit because previous jobs are only CPU jobs. Then at the end, we push this model into the cloud. So this is again uh, like a CPU job. And if the user request comes, more and more, and we cannot handle in the computer cluster. We, we, we have implemented Carpenter, which helps us auto-scale this computer cluster to receive more like uh, resource allocations. After all, we push the model back to the, back to the cloud storage. And with this setup, we can basically effectively create computational resources within minutes. It's typically three to five minutes to run a CPU or CUDA job. If it's a CUDA job, then we can request up to 16 GPUs, which is sufficiently enough for you to train any basically embedding model. I think we go back to Max. Yes, thanks, Paul. Uh, I will go now into the data preparation and synthesis part. So. Uh, when we look back at this slide, um, you see we talked about uh, the three left cases, about, uh, okay, we have proper training data or data that can be used for training in different scenarios. And now, okay, I only have my documents and perhaps I even have user queries, but I have no relationship at all. What do I do? And we saw already quite some interesting talks today uh, about this topic, but here will be another one, and uh, I think we have a slightly different angle, uh, especially in the conclusion. So a short disclaimer here, I will only show precision recall later on. Don't look at the numbers. It's just for the uh, metrics disclaimer. And the reason is that all the metrics more or less behave the same in our experiments. So there's no reason for me to show uh, more numbers and confuse you. That's the reason why I will only show precision recall. If you have another favorite metrics, it will behave almost the same as precision recall. OK, so I showed this image in the beginning. And now we cared a lot about, OK, when I have my training data, how I can fine tune. And now we will talk about, OK, how do I get training data if I don't have it in the first place? And this is heavily inspired by the generative pseudo labeling by Wang et al. Um, yeah, from last year. So if you want to look up this paper, it's quite interesting and uh, also inspiring. So what do we want? Ultimately, in the end, we want this. We want uh, queries, user queries, or queries, or queries uh, that we want to later serve, and we want products. 
and we want a relationship between these products and the queries, ideally with a score. Ideally, some more scored relationship. Um, this is uh, the best uh, that we can hope for. Uh, yeah, that's what we want. And so we do three steps. The first is we do query generation. So when we have articles, we generate queries out of them. Uh, we used in our experiments the T5 uh, model um, for the English ones and for the German ones. I don't know from the top of my head. Then the second point is, OK, now that we have these queries, we want to do negative mining. So we want to get a lot of, uh, for each query, a lot of uh, articles which are relevant. And for this, we used, uh, you should use a good embedding model. We used the best fine-tuned model we had beforehand. So we fine-tuned models beforehand and see some on the X market data set that we will later use. We saw uh, a good perform the best or different performance, and we just choose the best one and said, OK, this is the one that, which gives us the negatives, because uh, yeah, whatever this model returns us will be uh, documents which are either already positives or hard negatives. And now we need the pseudo-labeling. And here we utilize a cross-encoder. Cross-encoders, uh, also was said earlier today in, in several talks, uh, are ver usually very good in uh, some giving us a ranking. But they're computationally expensive, so you can't use them in live systems. But you use this cross-encoder, the quality of them, to get these scores. So we use our embedding model to get, uh, make a lookup, and then the cross-encoders to uh, score them. It's a little bit like a search uh, engine in itself, what you do for data preparation. And now we did the whole thing with English uh, X market data set. And uh, so what we always did is we prepared the data set, and afterwards we fine-tuned. And we did uh, a different setup, prepared the data set, and then fine-tuned. And what you see here for the English X market data set, um, we have at the top a pre-trained model. Then we have fine-tuned without GPL, which was the best we had before. So this is also the model we used for hard negatives mining. And then we have the fine-tuned with GPL. And what we see here. Uh, yeah, the performance went up. So nice, OK, it kind of works. That was uh, quite uh, lucky. And at the bottom, you see some of the experiments that we did over time. So if you, at some point, switch off, you can always see where the, which one is gray and coming back. Uh, so first, the English X-Market data said everything was fine. Then we did the same on the German one. And sadly, uh, the precision, OK, at least did not got worse. But the recall really dropped. And also, all the other metrics as more or less dropped or were the same. So in German, it didn't work. And that was unfortunate. And what we tried then is, OK, when it doesn't work, um, we have for this data set some user queries. So let's forget about the query generation, just check the user queries. So we remove the user queries, uh, the generated queries, take the user queries that we have, which also had typos and um, yeah, some are kind of dirty. And as a consequence, we go down from 250,000 generated queries to just 1,113 queries, but they were very well. They had a high quality because they were real user queries that, uh, yeah. And what we see when we look now in, at the results, OK, using user queries with the same model and someone losing the, uh, dropping the generative part but only using pseudo-labeling worked quite nicely. So both uh, matrices went up. Was OK, so for German it works nice. And the most likely reason is that the query generation model for German is not as good as for English because that's what you're, you're, the multi we use the multilingual model. And usually, multilingual models in other languages don't work as well as English models for English because the training data is much lower. And OK, let's do this with English. And now we see, ah, no real perform improvement. So uh, if, you have it, if we even have it for the same uh, model, then uh, and switch from the generated queries to the user queries, we have the drop in, uh, uh, in quality. And if we now switch the model, we get again an increase in model. OK, so changing model helped. But cha we unluckily didn't uh, repeat the experiment with the changed model with the generated queries. And, uh, but what can we do now? So I uh, talked earlier about the negative mining, and usually what we did before we uh, mined 10 queries. But since we don't have now 200, not 250,000 queries anymore, but just 1,000 queries, we can now mine much more and get some way more uh, uh, somehow uh, hard negatives. And then we did this, and out of a sudden we actually got better again. So with uh, user queries and a lot of hard negatives, um, actually our results got better again, which is kind of cool. And um, then two more comments about why generated queries don't work too well here. Um, the generated queries that we have usually look like this. So for an Intel processor, you somehow get these questions. But these are not questions that are uh, in the evaluation data set. The evaluation data set are usually uh, keyboard queries. And uh, that's the reason why these queries somehow have a, uh, are kind of dirty and don't really work too well. And user queries match the use case that you have at hand, and especially in a live use case, uh, wherever you want to apply them, you want to get real user queries um, in order to uh, 
mirror your use case in the training run. And less queries allows you to do more mining, so it gets especially the, the hard parts of your problem solved. So coming back to this picture, we now have, when you have articles and you actually have historic user queries that you just locked, that you don't need the connection between these two, then you can uh, do training data synthesis, do the fine-tuning job and get a model that performs better than the pre-trained models. Given, here's one catch. So uh, the given thing is that the historical user queries really match also or are similar to the queries that you will see in the future. If you have a big domain shift, you will have problems. So then it won't work as good. Um, but as long as they are similar, everything is fine. That's it for data preparation. Let's come to a conclusion. Uh, so what we have shown today, so we have a cost-efficient cloud resource allocation framework in Gina where we can allow a lot of fine-tuning runs in parallel. Uh, we allow data privacy by also self hosting the whole fine-tuning. Um, we have a rather easy user interface. I think we haven't talked about user interface too much today. Ah, OK, then let me skip through the next two points and just directly go to the pseudo-labeling. Um, the pseudo-labeling is um, effective, especially uh, even without gener or without generative queries. Uh, in non-English uh, text, it's very good without, uh, with user queries or custom queries. That's it for today. Thank you for your attention. And we open for questions. All right, thanks very much. Questions, please. It was a packed uh, presentation. Yes, there is one. One of the talks earlier today mentioned diminishing returns when coming up with things like more query examples over time. I'm wondering if you found that in your example and how did you decide how many hard negatives to do? Like what was the ratio of, of the hard negatives you were looking for versus your overall data size? Um, so we, I think we tried also with uh, to, so 10, 20, 50, 100 hard negatives, and we saw uh, benefits there in increasing it. And uh, also, uh, even with 100 uh, hard negatives, we had so few user queries that the training time was below 20 minutes. So we said, okay, we don't, uh, that's good enough, so we can also go to the maximum. And uh, I think we have not gone much further with like 500 or 1,000 hard negatives. All right. Uh, more questions, please. Thanks for the talk. So, uh, like, when people interact with generative AI, it's kind of common that they start speaking a bit more with natural language. Uh, wondering if you see uh, any shifts in, like, people, uh, you know, with all of these new techniques that will start uh, asking uh, in more, with more natural language in, in the search engines, for example, in an e-commerce set, or is it always going to be, like, people search just for keywords? I don't know. So I also suspect it will become more a natural language, uh, will, will happen more, but I think this shift will go a little bit slower, uh, or will go slow. So uh, it, hopefully, act, to be honest, hopefully it happens in the next, fi next five years, because I believe when people express what they want in natural language, they give more richness and more detail. Uh, by chance, somehow, uh, they, they put some details in which they don't want to, or when, which they wouldn't do in a keyword search, because they don't know how to express this in keywords. And so I hope that people will do this. If this happens, I don't know. And if we then go to data generation, I think we had earlier the talk, uh, Joe talked about uh, uh, getting training data via large language models, and that's also totally valid. So I think this is uh, something that we uh, also recently tried out, but didn't fit it into the talk uh, to try uh, to generate training data with large language models. And then you can somehow adapt, uh, adopt to this and say, okay, please don't just give me three words queries, but also give me 10 words queries as a real sentence or whatever. And then you can get uh, richer queries. Very good. Yes, uh, I think we've been conditioned for 20 years to just ask keyword query questions, not the natural language questions. It's going to take a few years to revert that, I think. Any more questions? Ah, there is one. Um, hi, thanks for your talk. Um, so you mentioned um, with the generated, you had 250 K queries to train on, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we looked at um, user queries, we looked at 1K, right? Uh, but your training pairs, uh, how many training pairs did you generate? So if you look at, I guess, 100 neg hard negatives, then it would be 100K training pairs? Yes. 
Did you try more, or less? Uh, did it yes, for the uh, generated queries, we tried to way more, some more uh, but I the difference, and so we saw quality goes up slightly um, over time, but the, the training time then at some point became unreasonable. So uh, when we, we had the training time going up to 20 hours plus, and this then doesn't allow you to do hyperparameter tuning and all the other magic that you want to do in order to get better or to balance, figure out what is the right setup for your uh, model tuning. So uh, we found the model training time of 20 minutes is quite reasonable. Then you can do a lot of hyperparameter tunings, also can during a day see your results and still reason about it. If you have 20 hours, you start your run today, think about it tomorrow. This always has, in my opinion, makes it harder to do uh, hyperparameter optimization because tomorrow you already have other ideas what you want to try, forget what you did yesterday yesterday and then some, uh, the, the closed feedback loop is not so, or the feedback loop is not so quick anymore so 20 minutes seems to be a reasonable uh, at least for us when we do model optimization for ourselves a reasonable um, middle ground between uh, extending the training and uh, being still capable of uh, doing iterations okay great talk of course uh, one question that I have is that, just like any other uh, machine learning model, will this also run into the risk of overfitting, and how can we avoid it? Yeah, yeah I'm not sure how, uh, if you use user queries, how bad overfitting is. So because in the end, uh, user queries, you say, uh, that very much depends, but if you use user queries, uh, queries also from the um, uh, head and from the small torso model, or however you call it, uh, I think then overfitting is not the worst thing to do because ultimately you, you solve a lot of your queries that you use as spring and you uh, yeah, give a good quality. On the other hand, if you solve the head queries anyhow with BM25 and you don't optimize with uh, vector search, then it might be not, uh, so use vector search only for the no head queries, then overfitting might be bad. Um, yes, so uh, <laughs> I'm not so sure how to answer this. Um, maybe I can answer from the technical perspective. Basically, we implemented two things into the fine tuner. The first thing, which might be interesting, called le layer wise learning rate decay. So, basically, you set a larger lear learning rate at the bottom layers of the transformer network, then the learning rate decays with the increasing of the layers. So, we try to build an assumption that after the layers, the top layers of the deep neural network should capture more semantic inf information and should be updated less. Another technique we incorporate is called YSFT. It has been incorporated as a callback within FineTuner. Basically, it's, what it does is really easy. It sets a threshold for your zero-shot model and pre-trained uh, fine-tuned model. So after your fine-tuning finished, you merge the weights based on the threshold you set. So this means you set a threshold for zero, which means the function work, neural network doesn't really work. So it's identical to your pre-trained model. If set to one, then it's uh, using the entire function model. So if you set to like 0 0.5, then it will average the weight between the zero-shot model and the function model to reduce uh, the overfitting. Yeah. All right. Uh, one more. Last question before the break, the coffee break. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Gra big round of applause, please.